Okay, so uh, yeah, welcome everybody to today's um, e-open house and you're currently in the session for industrial design. And here today, um, yeah, you have, you're in for a treat because we have so many, so many um, guests and speakers today, um, including alumni, tutors, as well as students. So for, to just maybe just to begin the session, uh, let's just go through a quick round of introductions from all the speakers here today. And um, yeah, so speakers can just introduce, you know, your, your names and kind of what you do. And we just go a quick round so that the students kind of know um, roughly who you are. Okay, so uh, maybe let's start with our alumni guests. Uh, how about uh, Celine or uh, Wenshu, please go ahead and introduce yourself for a short bit. Okay, uh, I can go first. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Celine, and I graduated from NUS in 2011, quite some time ago. Uh, and I'm currently a design manager at LinkedIn, leading uh, the growth design uh, for LinkedIn. Nice to meet everybody. Thanks for being here, Celine. Hello, I'm Wenshu. I, I graduated 2014. So now I'm a senior product designer at Shopify. So kind of working on sales channels right, for small, medium businesses. So yeah. Mm, yeah, thank, thank you both for taking the time to join us today. Uh, how about moving on to some of the tutors to introduce yourself, uh, Christian? Hello, my name is Christian Bouchonek. I'm the head of the Division of Industrial Design. I'm uh, very happy to be here for this uh, open house session. Thanks, Christian. Brian? Hi everybody, I'm Brian Stone. I'm one of the professors here in uh, the Division of Industrial Design. And my simple remark is, why would you not want to study with us in industrial design? It's great. <laughs> what a great opening statement, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, JJ? Yeah, I don't want to add anything after Brian's great statement. <laughs> but hi, uh, very nice to meet you, everyone. <clears throat> I'm JJ from Industrial Design. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. Um, can you hear me okay, or is there any delay? Uh, okay, Sounds good. good. <laughs> yeah, um, um, here I am teaching human centered design and user experience design, service design, and I am doing uh, many collaboration with. Um, the real uh, industry companies um, so that our students can really have experience of what it is like to work as a designer in this emerging industry. Very nice to see, like, thank you. Thanks, JJ. And now we also have two current students with us uh, in the call, uh, Li Ying as well as Zuling. If you could just do a quick introduction as well. Um, Hi, Li Ying here, um, final year student, yep. Yeah, hi, I'm Ziling from, uh, I'm a year three. Yeah, and I was from Poly Viscom. If anybody has a similar background, then feel free to show away. Mm, thanks for being here. And on the call, we also have Nadira. Nadira, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, everyone. Um, Nadira here. I'm overseeing the undergraduate portfolio in the division. So happy to see all of you today. Thank you. And last but not least, Don. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I, I don't know whether to introduce myself as a student, as an alumni, or as a teacher. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, I mean, just to chime in on what Brian said somewhat, you know, um, I was also um, a really a beneficiary of this program from many years ago, right? So it's almost like the happiest accident that happened in my life uh, because uh, I didn't want to study, uh, or I didn't know what was industrial design, and I somehow found myself in it. Um, and I haven't been able to leave it right now so far, <laughs> including NUS. Um, yeah, so I, I run my own practice. Uh, I teach at N, uh, NUS and also at the same time, um, uh, I'm kind of like an alumni, right? Okay. Thanks, Don. And of course, um, I guess that's also myself. Um, <clears throat> my name is Desiree. Sorry. <laughs> and I'm a teaching assistant here at NUS. I'm also an alumni from DID and a designer and researcher at Stuck. So let me just put up my screen again. You can do a very quick overview of the DID course program before we move into some sharings from the alumni, uh, tutors and students. So um, yeah, if I could just pass the time to Christian to maybe just give a broad overview of um, you know, the DID 
I guess, curriculum and, and kind of what makes us a little bit different from other courses? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but one, uh, one of the particularity when you look at this uh, slide, uh, can you hear me? It's okay? Yeah. Okay. It's the fact that uh, the, the student can uh, customize in one way uh, their, their project. And this is absolutely unique. And one of those, also the particularity of industrial design, but also some other discipline and design world is the fact that uh, when we start some project, we don't know the result. And this is something quite magic because each project is uh, unique. We invite the student to think outside the box. So we have set uh, some platform system uh, since now a few years, and we allow the student to select some different domain uh, of expertise. And it's a bit à la carte, and they built their expertise along the year. This is one of the originality of this program. And also, it's very important to mention that uh, this uh, customization is also related to some collaboration with the industry. Every year, we have some new partners from the industry who come and uh, would uh, propose to develop some platform with us. But, and um, it's, all, they, we, it's also the opportunity to have a, a early contact uh, with the industry from the second year for the student. And this open later some internship and some job opportunity. So the, the, it's very important to understand that our program is not frozen, but systematically uh, our colleague uh, and the industry will contact us, come and propose some new opportunity. And I just wanted to say that the particularity of industrial design is the fact that our discipline is reflecting the evolution of the society. There is some clear evolution since the 1950s in terms of sociology, in terms of politics, economic, technique, industrial, ecological. So many, many factors uh, are important for us. And our program, we adapt our program year after year to the need of the industry, but also to the evolution of the society. And this customization here we have on this slide reflect this extreme variety and that's why this program is so rich, because it's a, it's a continual evolution. Don you, or um, Brian, you want to add something, or Gigi? Yeah, let's have Gigi, right? She's uh, the host for this session. <laughs> um, yeah, as Christian said, the, the term industrial design is, you know, like, continuously changing and evol evolving to embrace the industry needs and technology revolution. So there is no really limit and a boundary, you no. Know? And design is not just um, the, the object, you know, to design the object, but design itself can be also the methodology or the method of inquiry. So with this um, designerly way of thinking, it can be applied like any uh, domains, any um, sector. So there is no really boundary and the limit. And in our curriculum, we actually uh, really support the students to build their own kind of career path by taking different options for the projects and the lectures. So we are here to uh, help you to build your own career in this um, huge opportunities. Ryan? I am here. Yes. Just had to top up my coffee. <laughs> uh, I, I, and just to sort of echoing some things that have, have already been said, but I think one of the exciting things is that everyone, all of our students is able to determine their own personal path to their career development. So they can work wide or they can work deep in a particular area. And the curriculum gives you enough time to make these discoveries as you move along. And then again, of course, if you find that uh, you really want to immerse yourself, there's uh, ways to <clears throat> continue your education through advanced degree, but we'll save that conversation for later. Yeah, thank you, Titus, for, for chipping in on, you know, just a, a broad overview, right, of kind of the multidisciplinary and very customizable nature of our course. And um, yeah, and our graduates from DID actually do get hired at, you know, a multitude of different 
uh, uh, companies from big to small and, and everything in between. And today we do have our special guests, uh, Celine as well as Wenshu, who are from uh, LinkedIn as well as um, Shopify, right? So perhaps now I should uh, just pass some time to, to them to share a little bit about their experience so far um, working in, in their workplaces and you know perhaps how the ID fits into to the picture at all. Yeah, if uh, Celine or Wenshu. Oh, sorry, so before, before we begin, for the students, uh, please feel free to chip in any questions that you have into the Zoom chat, okay? While, you know, we're talking and then we can try to address them along the way. Yeah, uh, Celine, Wenshu. Long jump past. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, so I think, um, so my path is a bit, I think a bit different from Celine. So I remember we chatted before. Uh, so when I first graduated, I started work as an industrial designer. So I actually worked with Dawn and, and Stump, like with the design agency. So, at, so as an industrial designer, I started my career by designing a lot of different things, right? Uh, I think we did airplane seats, souvenirs, at one point, I was designing shower heaters, like we did mobile apps as well. So like really a great like spread of different things, like different objects, like both physical objects to digital objects. Um, after two years at, at Stuck, I decided to kind of make the switch like fully into tech. So then I became a UX designer, spent a few years in a consult another consultancy, and then at Food Panda. So if there's anything goes wrong in Food Panda order, not my fault. Uh, but recently, I just joined Shopify. So Shopify is kind of a global company now. Um, our mission to kind of make commerce better for everyone. So if you've bought anything recently that's not from Lazada, not from Amazon, not from Shopee, um, it's most likely a Shopify store. So anyone can set up a store, design a website themselves using Shopify, and then start selling online. And then, yeah, it's been very big, <laughs> very long, weird journey. I kind of feel like I've designed a lot of different things. Right? And then I think, yeah, my education in, in industrial design really helped kind of build the foundations, right? Because it really taught me how to think, right? How to solve problems. Um, so yeah, it's been good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Sadine, do you want to know? Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Wen Shu. Uh, I, when I first graduated uh, from industrial design, then I worked a little bit as a industrial designer. Uh, also at stuck for a bit, and then uh, I was at uh, the um, Cute Center. No, it wasn't Cute Center, but I, I worked at NUS for a bit too. And then I worked at another uh, chemical-based uh, company uh, that does material stuff. Uh, and uh, after a while, after a year uh, as an industrial designer, then uh, I decided to pursue uh, a master's degree at Ohio State. Uh, and then studying under Brian, who was a professor at Ohio State. And that's where, <laughs> that's where I uh, kind of uh, started my journey in the United States. And after graduating from uh, Ohio State, I pursued a degree, uh, no, actually a career in user experience design. And I became a designer, user experience designer at a startup uh, for two years, two and a half years before uh, joining LinkedIn as a user experience designer. And just two years ago, I transitioned to become a manager, uh, design manager here. So uh, like, I believe the NUS uh, industrial design program like really uh, laid out a foundation just like Wenshu in terms of like how you think about solving problems. Because uh, initially I thought that, oh, I study industrial design and maybe I'm only, I can only do physical product and product design and you know but i realized that that's not that's not what it is only like the way you approach uh, solving problems it it can even be applied to everyday life like oh you meet you have a problem let's do the double diamond diamond process we kind of like find make sure we are solving for the right problem and then we iterate we brainstorm different solutions and then we test it test the solutions before we get to the final one and this thinking process uh like it sounds so like second nature right now, but I think like all of this foundation was formed uh, for the four years at NUS. Uh, so it was easy for me to transition into the different design disciplines after. Uh, of course, there are like specific technical skills for each of the design disciplines, but thinking process is the same. Yeah. 
So that's my little journey and blurb. Can I just uh, chime in a little bit uh, to uh, give a bit of context to Celine's role at uh, LinkedIn? Right. Um, nowadays, you see a very common trend of the inflation of titles, right? Where you start to see everybody is an AVP everywhere. You know, design manager at LinkedIn is a really big deal. Right? Yeah, I'm I'm quite pretty surprised that at LinkedIn they don't they don't do too much of this inflation of titles. But it's a really big deal. Okay, even though it just sounds like design manager. Okay. <laughs> Back to you, Desiree. Thanks, Don. Yeah, so I actually just wanted to ask some uh, follow-up questions, right, to both Celine and Wenshu. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Is there kind of like a biggest um, achievement that you have in design that you just, yeah, I just want to share with us so that we can also partake in some excitement for, for both of you? It's hard to choose like biggest achievement because I think like different stages of your life you kind of always have a little high about that that and you are like so proud at that moment and then there was always this little high um I think uh like the I can share as I as I progress in my career so my proudest moment when after graduation was when I submitted my uh, project, thesis project to the Dyson Design Award. And then I, we won second place. And then that was like my little, like, like my really proudest moment. And then um, the second time that I felt really proud was, uh, you know, when you start working at, uh, when I started working as a startup and the first time that like, your product is actually used by uh, somebody and then uh, especially like that's a huge client uh, it was a fortune 150 company that was like using our product for a startup and I was like oh yeah you know we have a true member right uh, like actually using the product and then after that like later now as a manager the way I think about achievement is slightly different now it's no longer like what I produce but like now I am leading a team of uh, seven designers and, uh, and my team is focusing on like growth, um, things like uh, first line workers and also uh, infrequent member guests international. So all of these are like uh, different groups of people that could be using LinkedIn and when they uh, kind of benefit from uh, the work that I do and my team is the one that is like uh, very effective and very productive in doing that. I also feel a sense of achievement uh, from it. So that's yeah. This is how I I I see like you know my different my different achievements and milestones along my career. It is really, Let me jump in here a little bit uh, to ask Celine to elaborate a bit more. You know um about her work, right? Because uh, sometimes industrial design is so flexible that it allows uh, one to stretch across to. Uh, UX, you know, and uh, service to apps and information, and and um, it's actually getting more and more unclear whether these things belong inside industrial design just because we teach it here within industrial design, or actually they are separate. But uh, it'd be great to hear Celine talk about exactly what you do at your work, so that the students here might see one picture of how uh, the learnings here can translate into some kind of career. Sure. Um, so I can share uh, two parts like UX design or like what a UX designer does. And then there's also like design manager, like what a manager does, because I think those are two quite different ones. And I think for user experience design, like generally, so the way I explain in the layman terms is that, okay, you have a product, like an application that you really like. Most of the time it's a software application. And if something is wrong with the product, like it's the engineer's fault, like it's a bug, you know, and then like the engineer didn't make it correctly. But if everything is developed correctly, but it's not great to use, like it's just like you always use it and you kind of like feel frustrated. That's the user experience designer's fault. Like they didn't, they didn't actually design it well enough. And I think this is, this is where I think like user experience designer is so important because like we make uh, the experience of using any application or product uh, very smooth that you enjoy, you feel delightful uh, during this process. So it's not just like, you know, completing different tasks task and then make it in, like you, you add a button here and that's it. Like there's a lot of thinking behind like human psychology. And this is why I think like industrial design, like it's totally about this. Like uh, 
traditionally you can think about industrial design like oh I design like a physical product but just think about it like when you use a physical product it's the same like if it's everything is like produced accordingly, then yeah, it's not the manufacturer's fault. But if you, you when you use the product and you think you're so frustrated by it, that's the industrial designer's fault because they didn't like design it properly. So the product is the same, but now you extend that whole thinking process and problem solving into uh, applications. And I can see, so the skill sets that you learn uh, in terms of how to solve it is the same. Uh, there are some specific maybe technical skills and I'm really glad to look at, to actually see how our curriculum has developed so much since I was an industrial designer. Uh, I was studying at NUS because like there are specific like majors that allows you to uh, pick up the skills that you need. Uh, you know, if you wanna be more of a UX designer uh, or product designer that designs an application, um, the curriculum also uh, teaches that. So I think like uh, I see industrial design more like uh, just expanding its definition to include like any type of product, which is like, it could be digital to physical to even like just services, uh, at least the way, the way I see the trend right now. Uh, then a little bit about my work uh, as a manager. So uh, in case you are considering, maybe this is too early in your career, but like, uh, if you enjoy really producing things, uh, like creating solutions, then that's what a, a designer does, right? Like they, they, they focus on the output. As a manager, my success is no longer in what I specifically produce, but to help my team become effective uh, in producing those outputs. So now my role, my role and my success lies in the success of my team members. So that's my that's that's the way I see the difference between a manager and also a designer. Celine, thank you very much. Uh, Desiree, I I just take up a few seconds maybe. Um, I I wanted to highlight one thing that uh, Celine mentioned, which was very pertinent. Um, we are here attending a CDE event, which is a design and engineering uh, um, college, right? So uh, I think Celine put it very well about how. Um, there are different roles in engineering and also different roles in design. And when something works well, you know, uh, needs to be also built well, right? Um, the the it's it's sometimes a matter of preference or where you this where you prefer to operate. Okay, so that's your interest. Uh, uh, do you like to really get something really well built and well resolved, or would you like to uh, engage more on the human side of the initial solution? Okay, so um, yeah, uh, that's that's kind of all I have to add. Mm, thanks, Don. Uh, how about Wanshu? Do you have kind of one, you know, moment that you could say that you're the proudest of, or you would say that maybe uh, it's a key takeaway from that point in your um, career? I guess, yeah, just like Selena, <laughs> over the years, there are many things that I'm quite proud of, but I, just because it's next to me, I think I, I designed this, right? so I think it was at stuck. <laughs> so one year, we were, SG50, we were doing a souvenir, right, and then I remember in office, I always stop out copy and it comes in a little bag and then there was no place to put it. Right? So I started using cardboard to make a cup that is like this shape. Like I'm using it as a pencil holder now, but so it fits the bag perfectly. And then when it came time to design a souvenir, then hey, uh, let's make this a product. So, so from a, in my industrial design time, right, this is something I'm really proud of. Right? So it's a product you work on, you design for months, right? you spend hours just looking at the little color, this curve over here. right? what material to use, how to manufacture it at scale, and then to see it all in the stores, right? Um, if you go to a national museum, you can still see it being sold. So that's a very nice feeling. Yeah. So I think it's because you design something and then to see it outside and being used by people, it's really nice. Um, and I think later on in my career, um, when I was in Food Panda, and I can't speak about this too openly, uh, I worked on some internal tools. So um, like when you order food from Food Panda, right? Uh, the food just comes, right? It seems really simple. Right? But what's behind that is a lot of layers of complexity. And at each layer, it has to be designed. Uh, there is a rider app, right? There is a restaurant app, right? Between the restaurant app and the rider app, there are like maybe five other apps in between. And they all talk to each other. So I, I was working in one of these apps. And then uh, there was kind of a problem that was causing a lot of issues. And then like in three weeks, then we fixed it. Right? And then it saves Food Panda like millions of dollars like, every year. Um, so it's kind of, these are kind of impact, right, that as a designer you can have, right, it's a lot more than just 
making things look pretty, right? I mean, that's a side effect of designing, right? It's also making things work really well, solving a business problem, solving a system problem, solving a customer problem. Um, so it's really nice. Like the, even though I never directly worked on a food and a consumer app, I know that I worked on the things behind the scenes, right? And then it's helping them save a lot of money every year, like from really small changes, right? That the design team came up with. So yeah, that's kind of what I've been quite happy with so far. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks for sharing that, Wenshu, and, and Celine as well prior to that. So, um, yeah, I mean, for, for students, right, you've kind of heard, I guess, a bit of a variety of the types of design that comes under the umbrella of industrial design that we do here at NUSDID. So, um, yeah, I thought to maybe at this juncture kind of show you a little bit of maybe some visuals and also potentially some video that um, we, of the past projects that some students have done here at NUS. So let me just share my screen again. Okay, so earlier, uh, let me just go back. Earlier we have kind of, you know, these broad categories, right, of the different types of uh, domains that our student projects fall into. So we'll kind of just go through a little bit of some examples under um, each of them. And of course, we'll then have some time for the tutors and students to you know, chip in as and when you want to talk about uh, a certain, a specific project or um, about a specific domain. Hmm. That's great because I think we have some tutors here who are hmm. experts in particular uh, topics. Uh, and maybe some of these projects are so led by them, so we will just let them uh, chip in when, whenever they want to. Yeah. Um, may, may, I I start? may I start? Uh, Christian, maybe we can go through to the next okay. slide, and then and then we see what comes. So okay. there's there's a okay. flow. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, and students are uh, now. Uh, okay. Maybe just to uh, lay some questions to rest first. Um, the the there was a question early on around. Uh, is it important uh in the portfolio to have a uh, cat? backgrounds your cat background is uh advantageous right um but uh, it's not necessary okay it's advantageous for you now um i just want to answer the question because that's the only question we've got so far and then we can move on to this segment then uh feel free to bring in questions now on on the things that you're seeing on screen all right then we will collect the questions and and facilitate that okay that's right yeah hmm. okay thanks don yeah so perhaps you know one of the first category that we have here is we have some projects of course in the space of innovation and invention for healthcare and medicine. So um, yeah, we have things like you know uh, uh, cutlery and and cooking tools for the use by the visually handicapped, or even things that you know aid in dementia um, patients to kind of remember and and recall certain things that they have done previously. So maybe just to give you an idea, we could just play one video of, um, yeah, just to give you a sense of what are some of these some of these projects like. So this one is a project called Rewind by Po Inger. Is there sound? Oh, do you not hear any sound? No. Okay, yeah. give me a second. I think I should reshare my screen. So I can give a bit of a, a background of this project, like while Desiree is working on the sound. So this was done as a, the, the student's final thesis project and in collaboration with uh, one of the work, nursing home Thanks, JJ. So I think, let me Thank try thing again and see whether the sound comes through, okay? Is the sound okay? So uh, just a quick 
uh, video on this. So, uh, Tutes, would you like to chip in at, uh, at this point? Anything about you know, uh, the project, the category of um, inventing for medical and healthcare? Uh, so, so maybe just to add a bit of context, because the video doesn't explain it that much. Um, for dementia patients, it's good to get them to go through and trigger the old mental pathways of, mm. of things that they have been doing, right? And so one of our uh, students in the past, she's actually graduated now, created this series of um, uh, interface objects which could allow um, you know, the grandmother or what to practice these things in the old folks' home or in the nursing home while they uh, trigger their old mental pathways for, for recall. So then, of course, this is great because uh, you know, they find it a little bit fun and convenient like a... Like a uh, almost an ASMR type of exercise. So you hear the sound, you see the visual, but without all the mess. So like in a in a nursing home, you don't have to set up a frying pan to fry eggs, but they can go through all of these things right, just with one device. Okay, hopefully that gives you a sense of what the project was about. Yeah, it's important to mention that this project has been uh, incubated in the Design Incubation Center and uh, recently won some uh, also international prize. So it's important to see that there is a life, the development of a project after uh, the, the final year and for the best project, we have the possibility to uh, develop, uh, in, to experiment, to go deeper and eventually to move to some production. Yeah, <clears throat> and uh, what we can do better on this is uh, then perhaps the some healthcare equipment engineers or developers is there are of course a lot of um, those machines and equipment and devices to help uh, the dementia patients um, rehabilitation and so on, but they are very technical and they are very functional. But as a designers, we will start from understanding their emotional needs and experiences and motivations and goals. So they chose this area of cooking and the uh, pouring tea, which is very, very nostalgia and brings uh, some emotions and the life values so that they can get better engaged in this rehab exercises and also you know, bring the past memories and talk about this so that they can have also the emotional comfort and somehow help their kind of um, cognitive you know, uh, the exercise. So that's what designers can do different from um, the, the, the equipment like uh, technology experts. I just wanted to add, because you, you introduced the word technology which is very, very important here. Uh, technology is a very important part for all designers, but all projects are not technology driven, meaning that we are purchasing some specific goal, we identify, uh, we identify some project, and the technology is here to serve the design product, to, to serve the project itself. It's not the starting point for us. Can I also ask that uh, alumni or students, current students, if you have anything to say, you know, just feel free to open your mic, yeah? We don't censor anything. <laughs> okay, maybe I, I, I would say one more thing, like maybe it has to do with the, the, continu like the, the continuation of the project. I got this um, kind of individual direct message from one of the prospective students whether we are also doing the social innovation project. So you will see from now that a lot of social innovation project and design for social innovation, design for tackling complex social problems is the emerging area of design because they see the potential from design approach that is very uh, future um, envisioning and the, um, and the prototype and iterative process. Yeah, so we have we do have those programs that support uh, design for social innovation topic. JJ slides for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, JJ. Yeah, yeah. Some visuals for some, you. Yeah, some of the project visuals from past uh, student projects here under this category. Ah, yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, so sh shall I explain or do, is there any visuals? Yeah. There are videos uh, if you want to play. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. like me to play Which the one? video on the? Anyone? Yeah, the anyone? first. The first. Yes. One? Okay. Yes. Sure. Okay. Great. Have you seen this banner before? So has Jay, a 25 year old who lives in the dengue red zone. He is aware of the risks and actions to prevent dengue, but he fails to see dengue as a personal threat because he has never had dengue before. At the HDB lift, he notices a digital banner showing real time information retrieved from an open data source. Information like the weather is shown before highlighting how these factors can affect personal dengue risk. 
It is alerted that there is a personal risk assessment available at any community centres or polyclinics. This assessment utilises real-time data from the National Environment Agency to provide an accurate evaluation. The assessment utilises a matrix that combines likelihood and harmfulness. J enters his postal code and location-specific dengue data is retrieved. This includes number of new dengue cases, the density of the Aedes population, number of identified mosquito breeding sites, and the rainfall history. The system will then use this data to calculate a score for his likelihood of getting dengue. He will then answer four key questions identifying his risk factors, such as age, whether he has had dengue before, whether his household members has had dengue before, and whether he has diabetes, affects his risk of getting severe dengue fever. The assessment will then calculate the harmfulness of dengue to him. Using both the evaluated scores of likelihood and harmfulness, a personal dengue risk score will be calculated. He will also be reminded of the actions he should take at home to prevent dengue. With a mosquito repellent patch and a personal dengue risk card issued, Jay is able to scan his QR code to assess his daily updated personal risk assessment as an online digital calendar. His dengue risk score for that day and a breakdown of the risk will be shown. He is also able to retrieve his dengue risk history and identify fluctuations in his risk, possibly notifying him of an increase in dengue risk in the future. The same risk assessment is also accessible through the QR code provider on the HDB screen. A digital copy of the card will be sent to the user via email. After learning of his risk to dengue, Jay can put on the complimentary mosquito patch to keep himself safe. The prominent smell and colour of the patch nudges Jay's friends to ask about it, prompting Jay to spread awareness about the assessment and the fluctuating risks of dengue. So what can this collected data be used for? A patient's trend data can help doctors recommend dengue blood tests to high-risk patients for early diagnosis. NEA can also utilise the data to identify neighbourhoods with a higher proportion of high-risk individuals for better allocation of resources. So I think in terms of uh, the, the applications that you are trying to develop here, in the sense of uh, communicating the actual risk to the public, using a more dynamic uh, strategy instead of just maybe a static banner. However, there's still a lot more to be tested as well to understand the real health, potential health, public health impacts to the population at risk in terms of how this digital information technology can help to change uh, some of their behaviours by not just increasing their knowledge but also sharing with their friends you know, in terms of the actual knowledge that is required to minimise their risk for dengue. Thank you. So um, this is a great example of the design project that combined social problem, which is a dengue and the low awareness of the dengue prevention and also the data. But this project was done in collaboration with the GovTech, especially open uh, government product team uh, with the idea, but there are a lot of this public data, open data available, but can we create new services and new um, programs that can benefit citizens' lives? So students came up with um, combining this, the, the, the people's data and the dengue prevention and design the necessary customer journey and the touch points to better engage uh, the everyday citizen to this dengue prevention program and also to, aware, uh, to, to raise the, the awareness of the dengue prevention. And they are kind of likelihood of getting dengue so that they can preempt and only on. Hmm. Thanks, JJ, for that. Maybe just as a, a, another, I guess, add-on to this segment, this, this series of projects, um, maybe we can also show this other project called the Grid City. Let me see if I can play it. Yeah. Hello, I'm Yuan Xie, and this is Grid City, a queue system that utilizes projection mapping to instill social distancing within groups and also uses data visualization to influence consumer decision making. I was intrigued by current visual indicators for social distancing in queues, where many establishments use creative techniques to tackle social distancing. And that leads to situations where customers will be left hanging in separate crowds. So, how can we reimagine visual queues for a recovering society in the COVID-19 pandemic as people get more and more used to being in groups of five? Great City uses computer vision to capture data from tools such as the Kinect, while processing those data into tangible visualizations projected on the floor in the queue and displayed online. The grid's projection interaction was designed with affordance in mind. To invite people to a grid, a small indicator lights up to an available space, 
when a member of the group enters a grid, a small circle lights up below their feet, indicating their position and their social distance radius. When more than one person is present in a grid, they are represented as a group in a larger circle and a boundary forms around them. A main aspect of this projection interaction is the recognition of groups as a unit and to provide adequate distance between each group. And so groups are spaced out between each other with different colours. When each of these groups comes too close in contact, an indicator will show that affects both the groups that are in contact. This interaction taps on the sense of self-consciousness in people to keep the groups safely distant. While all of these are happening, capture data is represented on a website converted into comprehensible visuals. With that, consumers are able to have a look to decide whether they will want to visit a place or whether a place is too crowded for them or not. Beyond that, they are also able to predict crowds with past data that was collected. By allowing more information to be visible, we enable better decision making for consumers and also keep crowded areas to a minimum. Here's a user journey map of Grid City and its accompanying website. Powered by projection light, Grid City can be used in places where physical visual indicators might be hard to see, such as a bar or a club in Clark Key, or even places where group queues are common, such as in a shopping mall. And with that, Grid City enables consumers to get informed about crowded queues and be assured that their group of five won't be too close to another. Thank you. All right, I want to chime in on this uh, and give you some context right, for everyone. Um, firstly, uh, uh, this is not a project led by me, but, um, but I know of this project uh, is done by, I think, uh, UNTA when he was a year two student at that time. Um, if, yeah, either year two or beginning of year three. So this was when the pandemic first hit. And you know, as designers, we like to respond very quickly Right, to whatever is around us um, and therefore the school also likewise you know hosts projects uh, in that same topic so that we can see how uh, design could be used as a tool to impact right uh, real change now um, one of the things that you might have noticed right uh, if you are very sharp is that this is not really going to work right <laughs> in most places just because you have to set up a projector is really bright now I want to I want to um, help you understand that a lot of these projects sometimes they are painting firstly a vision or a possibility for using some kind of way, um, whether is it the projection or what, uh, and some kind of information to affect behavior. And that is the focus of the project. Because once we realize that, oh, you know, um, causing things from white to turn to red will cause people to feel like alerted and, and stand apart, right? Then actually that kind of uh, medium or information can be reapplied later on in many different forms that are more doable. And that's where sometimes a deeper collaboration with our engineering friends helps. Right. Um, the, the, I mean, designers do take uh, projects all the way through, right? but uh, sometimes in projects, it stops at this exploratory phase, especially if it's a very quick one semester project, like in this case, from a year two student. All right. Okay. Um, any comments, anyone? Yeah, all these projects were, were done within a semester, about for 11 to 13 weeks. And I think by now, like by seeing a few projects, the prospective students will see how design actually is very, very interdisciplinary. Once you earlier spoke about business, uh, so business, um, the sol business solutions and so on. So the key strength of designers and our design program is uh, to build the capacity of connecting different disciplines and using those knowledge to create something beneficial and something pleasurable for the real users. So that's where the creativity comes into play. So synthesizing all those disciplinary knowledge and creating, translating those into something that is very close to the actual everyday people. Um, so in the in this sort of um, the studio course in the semester, uh, the project setting, the, our faculties uh, create the learning environment where the students can interact with um, various experts and the problem owners and stakeholders so that they can have this um, uh, essential knowledge about disciplines and the social problems. And by using design process and design methods, they can solve and they can tackle those problems into something new to propose in our desired future. Mm, thanks for that, JJ. Actually, maybe at this juncture, it would be good to get uh, the students that we have in the call today to maybe share a little bit about your experiences with this kind of platform project. 
um, that we've current been students, about right? so far. Yeah, current students. <laughs> okay, great, great. With That's your great. experience uh, with the platform studios so far. Yeah, hi. Uh, it's Ziling here. Maybe I can chime in. So uh, just wanted to add on to JJ's point on Yuan Jie's uh, project because I was there when he when he did the work. Yeah, and I am he's. It is, is if you can see his video is actually very impressive in terms of like the visuals, the, the video and the motion graphics. And that's because of his background in poly, which where he came from motion graphics. Mm -hmm. But then um, when he came over to uh, uh, ID, he's able to, you know, go deeper into things like design thinking, problem solving. And you really see his skill set from poly that is being applied uh, and being utilized even in his, uh, in his time in ID. Yeah, so I, I thought that was quite interesting to bring up. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Thanks, Ling. That's great to bring up, right? You yourself also have a bit of a different background. Yeah. Right? Yeah, mm. and that shows in your work also. So, uh, I mean, some of you have seen the slides that the mixture of uh, your strengths and even weaknesses, right, makes you a very interesting designer. Uh, Yuan Jie has fully utilized whatever he has as a background to bring into this. Yeah. Uh, well, like Zuling said, and also like what Don says, right, really like the different kind of backgrounds that um, kind of uh, contribute to your um, skill sets currently. But then again, there's always like your um, teammates, like sort of platforms allow the juniors and the seniors to interact, right? And so it's always an opportunity to pick up skills from not just your, your group mates, but it's also a, a way to also learn from each other, sort of like platforms, um, people sort of like teaching um, new skills, new um, perhaps even tutorials and such that they have watched. And then they're like, oh my God, you got to learn this. And then these are like sort of co-sharing kind of um, skill set, sort of like ensure that the cohort from year two, year three, year four, grow together and sort of like learn and sort of like share. And how do we sort of like keep continuously um, improving um, ourselves and not just um, the individual, but also as DID, how do we sort of like continuously become better and better? Yeah. I, uh, I'd like to add a little bit of, uh, about like backgrounds and like skill sets. You don't need to have anything also like this I wanted to mention because I don't know I, I don't I didn't study any like motion design whatever whatever design like the only thing I knew before I joined industrial design was like I draw comics and that's like I, I thought I don't even know what design is and I thought hmm I think I can use this skill for design but yeah it, it doesn't matter like I think to me like what I uh what I um what I, how I decided eventually that uh, is design is actually about creation, right? And there is something there is something that you want to maybe solve for. Uh, there is like, uh, and then you want to uh, create a solution to solve for something. And it's like some real human problems. And a lot of the earlier projects that were shared was like really nice. Like it all started with a problem, right? If you notice all of the video, oh, this person like, has this issue, uh, or we society have this issue. And you can have an, like a problem at a very personal level, or you can have a problem that is like not really related to you, but for somebody else. And this whole process is about like really understanding the problem in a very deep way and think about many different solutions to solve for that. And then you kind of eventually through this process, you will generate many ideas and able to narrow down the right solution eventually. So this is the process, the innovation process that I think when we talk about design thinking, uh, this is like what is taught through, through, uh, through school. And I, uh, and I think that, 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 that is actually applicable to um, any problems that you face in life. So yeah, I just want to say you don't need to have anything uh, skills also. And you can develop them over time. Yeah, th thanks for that words of comfort, I guess, Aline, <laughs> because um, it's true. I, I mean, for, for myself as well, I came in with basically nothing, like no skill set um, related to design. Uh, in terms of hard skill sets, lah, that you know, I don't know how to use programs. I don't know what is CADing. I was like, what is this? I didn't know this was a render. I always thought it was a photograph. I didn't know anything, and I came in and I kind of, you know, um, learned along the way with the projects that uh, we we do. And depending on which one you pick, and you get to hone different skills that you wish to. Okay, so um, let me just put up my screen again, and 
just share a couple more different projects. So uh, students, please feel free to chip in again, any questions, uh, I mean prospective students, uh, to chip in any questions you have into the chat at any time. Well, while you're pulling up the slides, I'll just answer questions because I know people are coming in and dropping off, you know, so <laughs> their questions might not be answered. Are portfolios required? No, they are, they are not, right? Um, this is, I think Nanako asked this question. Uh, yeah, but of course, it, if you have something or if you could piece together a bit of like a portfolio that's not even necessary art portfolio, it will help us to understand you a little bit more, all right? Um, yeah, it's not, not required. That's the official answer. Mm, thanks, Don. Okay, so maybe just to share uh, maybe slightly different kind of category domains of the projects. So this one, um, we also do have projects about food design and new sensory and cultural experiences. So perhaps just to show, uh, I guess a lighthearted and quite a, quite a funny video project uh, for everyone to take a look. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about this. I'll talk about yeah. this. You know, um, I have to talk about this because uh, I didn't teach this project, but this is one of my favorite projects from NUS so far in the years I've been here. Um, and I'll, I'll explain to you what's going on somewhat. Now, one of the things that we learned in this school is that you could maximize the potential with very little resources. And you don't always have to put the maximum tech to things. And that's why one of the things that we teach the students is how do you even do some magic with the simplest ingredients? And, and therefore, even something like jelly, right? How do you bring that to the next level? Um, now, this kind of training is very good for students um, when they become very resource conscious and then later when they apply it to actual tech, right? When they use uh, things like AR, VR, you know, they are maximizing its potential instead of just using it for what everybody's using it for. So you can see over here in this jelly exercise that um, from something that we normally eat out of a little cup right, with uh, a bit of sloppiness, right, uh, they've almost made it into a celebratory experience. They've optimized it so that, you know, the shapes, you know, the way they've designed the shapes at the top uh, have gone through so many rounds of testing so that it wobbles the best, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a bit of a crazy obsession, but it is the fundamental uh, type of thinking uh, that we bring here. We try to bring um, the human aspect, what will, what will tickle the human's uh, spirit, right? At the same time, uh, we try to achieve it with the minimum of resources. Okay, so hopefully you, you catch that. And that's why it's one of my favorite projects here. Yeah, thanks for shipping in, Don. Any other teachers or students, any reactions, even maybe alumni <laughs> reactions to this or any responses that you want to add on? You know, maybe one thing to add is it's very fun, right? I think, and the topic of fun, I think design school is very fun. <laughs> the, uh, like throughout my four years, like, I never felt like I was really studying. Like, we don't do exams, right? It's just projects, right? Um, and then every project you create something with your, with your friends, right? And each class, each cohort is very small. I think it was back then for my class, it was like 30 plus. So you make really good friends. You have a lot of fun in the studio. Um, yeah, my, my, my JC classmates who went to business school or engineering law, like, they hated uni. Right? <laughs> for me, it's like, hey, I had a fun time. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> Right, so it's a very fun thing. Right? So I think something to think about as well, like if you enjoy creating things, um, working with different people, right? creating things all the time for four years, it can be a very fun, uh, very enjoyable four years. And when you start working as a designer, a lot of designers do like their jobs as well. Right? It also happens to pay well these days. So yeah, why not? 
I mean, this, this, this what makes me think of that. Yeah, which would, maybe I just chime in on what you just said. Um, and actually, very frankly, very often I say those same things and. Uh, I just want to tell everyone that you know sometimes we designers can be a little bit uh, silly and egocentric, right? So um, we 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 recognize over time that actually even our uh, we have very good friends in engineering who are super good at their crafts and they love it. Okay, so the when you hear success from one side, that might be the wrong picture. Um, and many of you might be actually interested in doing engineering. And I think that's uh, totally uh, encouraged to go investigate that. Yeah. But sure, no problem. You know, I uh, always say that also. <laughs> I think this team culture is very important to highlight um, as um, Kuali and the ones you said, we really have this team culture and those faces in this wobble jelly are all our ID students. So there are many, many projects within a semester then the, the all students kind of experience and test, enjoy each other's project and kind of experience together and share their comments. So it naturally really like creates peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer fun. And yeah. this team, being a team member is a really like um, the core capacity to be developed nowadays for our, you know, the talent. Uh, I just wanted to add something. When I look at all the photo here, it's a perfect illustration how Design Fundamental year one where we develop uh, some element of design, we start to develop our own, uh, to develop the own sensibility of each student in terms of form can be applied later through the different platform and final year project where everyone finds his own identity in terms of language. So there is a direct correlation between those fundamental and the platform and the thesis project. Thanks for that uh, speaker so far. So I do have one question coming in from a prospective student. If I could just have um, yeah, everyone to kind of chip in. And the question is about, um, they're wondering whether it's difficult to cope with this course without any sort of art background because they're interested, but you know, kind of just worried lah, that you're unable to cope well because there's no, uh, they didn't have any formal art experience except you know, kind of a lower secondary uh, kind of education. So yeah, is it difficult to cope with this course without any art background? Um, maybe I could speak. So like, I've seen um, classmates or even like uh, friends who actually design with literal post-its of ideas, like just writing off like um, keywords rather than to draw out the whole thing. So it's not necessarily uh, essential that you need to be able to let's say draw and perhaps uh, color and such so it's more of like your your curiosity to find out what are the other ways to do and approach uh, a problem let's say and sort of like solve that issue so there is many ways to ideate and post it is one there's other ways to to sort of like um, always come up with solutions. So I don't think it's really super necessary, but then always see our people being so curious that they actually picked up the skills by themselves or so. And the idea that you are not alone and sort of like the camaraderie of like people sort of like um, pushing each other to sort of like grow and be better is kind of the, the DID spirit, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you if you notice closely enough in the videos right that you've seen whether is it the grid city one on the floor and also the jelly one <laughs> right um the interactions of the students are like that in real life right they when they work together it's it's always really like a, a boot camp sometimes we call it okay um we don't tell them to shoot these things that way to, to show us how fun it is <laughs> yeah um i also like to add the example that in the industry there are many people that come from many different that background that is not even like design, not even art related, that chose the career to become a UX designer, right? And then they can they can pick up the skills later. So I think the good thing about like right now, like you go you go to school to actually pick up all the skills you need to be a designer. Um, and drawing is just one skill that could be helpful, but like you can be really good with, uh, I mean, terrible with sketches, but like really good with computer graphics. 
too. So, you know, it doesn't, I think, I think, I, uh, yeah, as we mentioned earlier, having a variety type of like background that like you, you can come in here to actually pick up all the skills you need. Yeah, yeah. well said, Stalin. Yeah. So the key question is not like whether to draw well or not, but whether they have a means to communicate their ideas. So it can be drawing, it can be even, you know, writing, it can be some simulation making, computer graphic and so on. So as long as one develops a one's medium to communicate and the visual communicate and express their ideas, yeah, then you, 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 you've got a tool. Yeah, maybe I just want to add on to that. Uh... I mean, uh, usually what I'll do when I face a problem with a hardware or not, our first thing I'll do is just Google and watch a tutorial. But um, sometimes those things don't work out and it's the longer way around. And you can always, you know, troubleshoot with your friends around. I mean, I do recall myself um, going to Lean once um, for a caddying issue that I had. And there was this one time uh, I wanted some help with like some motion graphics and I went to the And yeah, this, because everyone in um, uh, ID sort of like have very different uh, expertise and whatnot, yeah, you, you just sort of go to the people that you think might know what you need help with and they are more they are usually more than willing to help you with the stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for the uh, students who are here, there's a reason why we um, believe that uh, we should do a lot of projects in NUS and DID where it's uh, real, where people actually use it and, you know, we put out there to test. The reason is because when you really do real projects, um, there's so many aspects of it you have to take care of. Suddenly, it becomes uh, entirely multidisciplinary and therefore you have to rely on each other. That That is one of the real um, uh, situations when you really go out to work, right? Uh, it is the exact same thing and that's why you cannot live in silos in that sense. Now, industrial designers, we, we, we focus on one aspect which is uh, a specialization around how human beings perceive, use and adopt things, right? Um, but at the same time, we also... Um, learn to appreciate and then collaborate across all kinds of disciplines and rely on your classmates is one of the the, the, the foundations uh, here to build that ability to trust someone else, someone else and work in teams okay yep um maybe just to add in i studied a level art before in us and then i thought it would help me when i come in but in the end when i came in like, <laughs> this makes no difference at all uh, i think in the end it's less about your background and more like your interests and right? where you want to put your effort in like in, after, in the end, when I came in, I realized I, re I really like 3D modeling. And so I just kept doing it. And in, in the end, I got quite good at it. So it's, it's more about what you want to focus on when you come in. Um, and in reality, yeah, when you go out, talk to any professional designer, that most people don't sketch well. <laughs> you don't need to. Like, um, I mean, like this is the sketching that I do these days. Right? It's just random squares on a piece of paper that looks like chicken scratch. But in reality, yeah. So I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. yeah, no, but you see, I'm sure you know, you say what you are from art, then Celine says she cannot draw, but she says she draws co comics, <laughs> you know? Um, okay, just let me chime in here, right, for the record. Desiree and myself, we have zero art background, okay? We came in totally geeky. <laughs> no, yeah, shit, wrong, wrong word again. But anyway, zero art background, okay? Uh, just to, to, to lend some voice to the other side. <laughs> Yeah, actually, on a related note, there's another question coming in from another prospective student on the other end of the spectrum, asking whether math and science is required in this course, because um, I guess uh, with uh, asking whether there's any implications with the merger with the school of, uh, now that we are school of um, College of Engineering and Design, right? Will there be any engineering courses that are implemented within the curriculum structure now that we have this merger? Would Nadira be the best to answer that? Apparently, uh, there's no uh, engineering modules, but students are actually free to read up uh, engineering modules as part of their UE requirements, uh, unrestricted electives. Yeah. So you can actually choose a wide range of uh, modules uh, as part of your UEs from FASS, um, uh, engineering, um, and science. And all that. I don't understand what you say. I don't understand. <laughs> Thanks, Sorry, thanks we just had the mute question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks Nadira. Um, I mean, in short, um, the merger has given you uh, an advantage, right, to have the options to be more, you know, uh, multidisciplinary if you want, and and in a in a formal way instead of just uh, 
uh, whatever you could cobble together online. Okay, so it, it doesn't restrict you from uh, going that way. It also doesn't force you to go into engineering modules. Yeah. Mm. I guess on a related note, also another question coming in. Um, it's just, you know, if, you know, since we're talking about so many different types of, uh, like art, like, you must be good in art, it must be good in uh, science or, you know, you don't need to, but the student is asking if they are weak in a specific topic or I guess a skill set, will there be regular consultations with lecturers or professors um, to, to help these students? Are, are basically in short, are the tutors approachable enough to, to do this? Maybe students, you want to chip in first before the tutors say anything? Selena, say first. For me, honestly, reaching out to tutors had always been pretty easy. Most of the time, because I feel like a lot of, of the tutors, they, they do set up like some sort of platform. Like for example, a, 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 a platform that I took last semester, they use Slack. So you can just simply send them a Slack message. And I know that uh, there was this one time I was working on the open house with Don. All I do is literally just text him and he'll reply you at like, at like whenever he's free. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really quite accessible uh, to, to get um, tutors feedbacks and stuff like that. Hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, can it's I? Really, what say? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. That there was less, I couldn't hear your voice. Please go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, like what Zeling said, right? It's really um accessible and uh the tutors really are really nice and sort of like similar situation with Don also in the sense that when I was like doing his platform project, <laughs> I was texting him at 11 p.m. for help for cadding or something, and he's still responding and sort of like um guiding my team along in resolving our cat issues and such, and sort of like Although it's not recommended that you work uh, beyond um, 11 and such, but it's the idea that um, our tutors really give in 110% to make sure that the students and their um, the juniors are not struggling. Yeah. So it's really nice. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I would say the tutors are very approachable because, because right, every single design project is very, very unique. And within the project, right, the topic that individual student and individual group deals with is also very, very particular and unique. So it cannot be really um, taught like by giving a lecture or by just a big class size, you know, activity exercise. So I think individual tutor believes this one-to-one -one interaction. We're really looking at the, the problem that students are dealing with by doing that, we can actually understand the problem better. And through the conversation, we can somehow find a way to go about the problem. So I think the tutors are very willing to talk with the students for their own problem that they are dealing with for their project. And there the learning like comes. Mm. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing a little bit about that, you know, uh, I guess culture, learning culture in, in DID. Uh, from yeah, both both students and tutors. But I guess uh, looking at the time, uh, we just have a little bit of time left for one, I guess, slightly different kind of domain of projects that we have. So just to give you, uh, you know, uh, an idea of really how wide the spectrum of, of projects that we do here. So if you look at my, at my screen, um, this domain is uh, around the invention of tools, mechanisms, materials, and new structures. So it's quite a quite a vast, I guess, stuck difference to some of the projects that we've shown previously. And maybe just to show that, I will show you a video of one of them.
Ezri, I, I chime in on this. Right. Um, now, uh, you see, this is where things start to have some overlaps with uh, engineering, right? And actually design, we can't avoid that. We, we have that, uh, we have to almost go a little bit into every space. And in this case, what you're seeing, uh, you know, this was a project that was done quite some time ago, maybe six years or five years ago at least, right, by a student of ours for his final year thesis project. Um, and what he was uh, working on was how do you take soft robotics, which is not a new concept, you know, it's being explored more and more nowadays, but how do you do it with the simplest uh, uh, materials, right, and the lowest cost possible? And he basically found a way to seal foam, like sponges, right, and then use like syringes to vacuum air out and to put air in to cause all this motion to happen, which means, right, as an industrial designer, he's pushing the boundaries of how do you, you know, get tech to be even more accessible at some point in time to everybody, okay? So there are these things that we, 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 we you know, it's a, it's a big spread at industrial design, but it's always back to this question for human beings and minimizing resource impact. Yeah, thanks, Don. Any other tutors, students, even alumni who chip in at this for this uh, project or this, you know, domain? Maybe Desiree, I think we could look at the next video over there, which is the, the and and we could have Christian talk a little bit about uh, tactility and you know. Uh, when he does buttons and stuff this is not his project in that sense but it's the same kind of a skill set that christian has been teaching us right on on semantics semiotics yeah mm. okay may i say something our group export various haptics that can be created with magnets we tested different factors such as materials combination of magnets and their placements ultimately we wanted to create a variable feedback mechanism that allows one to experience different haptics through the same gesture in electronic systems, haptics are easy to vary, but mechanical systems do not have this luxury. So, how can we introduce the flexibility of customizing haptics in mechanical systems to give users a greater sense of control and flexibility in their interactions? We found two main ways that magnets create haptics. One is through surface impact. When a free-moving magnet is dragged along the surface, it collides with the surface texture, causing a pattern of sensations to be felt. Another way is when the magnet overcomes the resistance of the profile. Different profile heights require a different effort to push the magnet along the surface. We tested the properties and limits of our magnets with various surface profiles and configurations. We then narrowed it down to four variable feedback mechanisms, focusing on precision, customization, convenience, and compactness. This is a dial. When you turn it, you feel this. You can hold it down, and now it's like this. This happens as the magnetic ball rolls against two different surfaces. Now when you scrap your video timeline, you can easily toggle between general and fine tuning to enjoy greater control and precision over your workflow. This is a regular button. With a simple toggle, it now feels different. Can you hear that? Similarly. This happens when the ball moves against different surfaces. With just a click, you can customize your mechanical keyboards according to your needs and preferences. This is a switch with a dial. It now returns to the middle. Now it snaps to the sides. And now it glides smoothly. This is because the surface of the dial has different profiles. And yep, you guessed it. This creates different haptics. In the light switch, this allows you to toggle between different functions such as dimming, adjusting light temperature, or turning it on and off. Lastly, another dial. It feels pretty normal right now, but if you turn this, and then this, it snaps into place. This happens as there is a bump on the movable surface that causes a click when the ball jumps over it. You can change the position of your oven from 18 to 23 minutes, so you get a perfect crust for the new bagels you bought. With Tuk Tuk, you can easily introduce varying haptics into mechanical systems. You can scale and adapt them to different contexts, enabling compactness, convenience, precision, and customization. Tuk Tuk! Thanks, Desiree. Again, another student project. Let's have Christian talk about this, right? since he's so much into buttons. I just list, I close the door because it's too easy. 
Uh, Christ- anyway, so, for students, Christian is our head and uh, yes. he teaches a really iconic um, course around buttons and manipulating uh, small little ships. So let's have him say, say something. Uh, I'm happy to see this. Uh, if you have, maybe you hear some background because it's raining a lot here. Um, I'm happy to comment this project because this is a direct uh, illustration of how some uh, fundamental causes can uh, impact the, the platform. Uh, during the year one, uh, one of the exercises of fundamental is to uh, design three button control where naturally the user is going to action in the appropriate way. So this is something extremely important at, at the sensorial level. And uh, I'm happy that some exercise coming in the platform are also directly related. Here we have some button, but all kind of product we, are, we develop, physical product we develop during the platform are directly related to the fundamental we have uh, experiment during the, year, the, the first semester or second semester year one. Desiree, should we try to answer questions? Now that we have only about 10 minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And maybe so, we can have a alumni chime in more also after that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh prospective students, please feel free to um send us your questions in the chat or if you would like to, uh simply yeah, uh, unmute yourself and ask away as well. So you can you can ask anything about, you know, uh the course, what it's like, job prospects. Um, yeah, the experiences so far, how the how student life is really, really like, um, anything really for the alumni, tutors, and also current students to answer. There's a question for, I think, um, maybe Nadira, I'm not very sure, uh, but but it's, it seems like it might be a difficult one to answer precisely. We might need to check on the information for you. So Eileen has asked this information, Eileen E. Uh, hi, may I check the course content for industrial design? Is there a specialization for product engineering and AI? Can I apply with H1 physics instead of H2? Thanks. Right. There are, I think a few questions. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll post it in the main chat so that uh, we can see it. Um, we might not have answers to all of this. Uh, we might have to give you, know, give you back uh, this thing uh, from our Telegram group uh, later on. Now, do you write anything for this? I think maybe um, can I apply with H1 physics instead of H2 because our um, admissions requirement is, just give me a moment, uh, is um, H1 for A-level certification is H1 pass in maths or physics or cons. Um, for for poly, poly, polytechnic students, NAFA, uh, LaSalle diplomas is any acceptable diplomas. Um, we have also um, students coming in using uh, with the international qualifications, which is the year 12 or higher level pass in arts or economics. Um, also, there is the NUS high school diploma, uh, as well as the international uh, bachelorette uh, pass is pass in SL, uh, MAE or physics or econs or visual arts. So regarding your specialization, uh, maybe we can follow up with that later. Yep. Yep. Eileen uh, or whoever else has questions like that, please join our Telegram. I put the link over there um, so that we can find a way to answer to you, right? Else uh, we have no way to reach you. Is there any questions on your side from any others? Oh, no new ones so far. Okay, so I have one from Justine. I, uh, how do you overcome those slums where during the ideation process you struggle to come up with ideas even though you have a rough idea to what the issue that came about during the refinement process? Okay, yeah, it might sound like a long sentence over here. I think uh, I'll take that. Um, the, the question seems to be asking how do you get more ideas if you are stuck? Okay, um, I, and I think many people might have uh, this same question. Um, one first thing I want to assure everyone here is that we teach you that. Okay, so it may be too much to um, explain in a session like that, but we we teach you that and we condition you to become um, uh, free flowing with ideas. Now, as a little tip for everyone here, one of the things that we try to do, right, is to reduce the variables in your mind that you that you handle at any one time. Okay, so give you an example. 
if you are trying to um, create many ideas, say for, say, uh, a button, like, you know, we've seen a, a, a examples early on. But if you try to um, create uh, a new button altogether, you might feel very stuck with ideas. But if I tell you to say, hey, don't worry about buttons first. Now, can you, can you just create 50 different shapes for the top surface of the button? Right? That, that reduces essentially the number of questions in your mind. You could draw out 50 different shapes all together very quickly just for the top surface. And later on, we start to layer on the complexities to say, now what, what can the, that shape do? Okay? And then actually very quickly from no ideas, you have 50 plus ideas uh, just because you know how to limit uh, what is loading your mind at any one time. Okay, so Justin and everyone else, I hope that gives you a small taster. Um, I really want to answer this question, but it's just not something answerable in a, in a, in a Zoom uh, call like that. Yeah, maybe just uh, if you do join the Telegram group chat, you can always ping on to elaborate more on this answer in the Telegram group. Okay, I have another question coming in. Maybe Nadira may be able to answer this. Um, students asking whether there are a lot of international students in this major, or would you be able to know kind of what is the, the ratio of international students? Okay, maybe uh, our intake is currently around like 50 to 55 students. We do have uh, international um, students among us, but um, just a small amount, maybe like around three to four of them per year, per academic year. Hmm. Thanks for that, Nadira. Okay, any last questions from the prospective students? Yeah, I just want to say, feel free to join us uh, on the chats, right, so that we can help you uh, think through more, right? Uh, it's, it's really a short time right here. Yep, and there is another opportunity to meet us physically next Sunday. Oh, if yes. You, yeah. <laughs> if you really you know, want to get to see and feel what we do. Mm. Okay. Um, maybe it... it... I have one question here that just came in asking about the aptitude test. Uh, yeah, what will, what will we have to do in the aptitude test? Okay, so basically during the aptitude test, uh, prospective students will be shortlisted to go through an interview session for admission to the uh, our ID program. So during this interview, there will be a small uh, design exercise that uh, they will have to complete. They can also show us uh, a portfolio if they have um, to the set of interviewers. So basically the admission to the course will depend, uh, will actually depend on the outcome of this uh, interview session. So it will be uh, shortlisted candidates um, will be informed of um, this uh, session sometime in early April. Yeah, and then the final outcome will be uh, conveyed by Office of Admission sometime in mid-May. Mm. Yeah. And that design exercise at the aptitude test, again, it is not about we see whether the how well this person draws, makes or not, but it's more about how well this person has some interesting idea and how well this person can articulate and the one's idea logically and in a convincing manner. So that's what we are focusing on to look at. Uh, I want to ask something is uh, many, many students come back every open house, very, very stressed, thinking the aptitude test is related to the, the, the skill of to be able to draw, to, to control 3D CAD, absolutely not. So we, you are not. We 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 often prepare prefer to have some student who don't have so much background, technical background in design in a three D CAD. Uh, we are more evaluating the sensibility to design, the capacity also to uh, to have some interest or to uh, uh, work in a team eventually, and also to uh, the curiosity and the passion for this discipline more than the, the skill. So it's, it's a kind of more kind of open discussion. So we, we are looking this sensibility to the design world more than the skill itself. I hope it's clear enough for the students who are so stressed about that. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so yeah, considering now it's 
at 12 p.m. So we'll perhaps wrap up today's session because uh, we maybe just have some last words of advice from Celine and Wenshu, who are our guests for today. Mm, I can say, uh, uh, I think if you like to create things, uh, this is the course to go. And you don't have to be too stressed out about whether this is the right path to go down. Uh, like this is really right for you. You learn it through this process. And as mentioned earlier, there's so many variations and you know career paths that you can go down. And this skills like design thinking skills is actually applicable. Even if you eventually find out that, oh, you don't want to be a, like a designer, like there's, you can actually apply this like problem solving skills in like a non-design job because it's like really creative thinking. Um, yeah, so, so just saying that um, there, there is this, you, this, is, this course is even useful, even if you don't want to be a designer. So there's no wrong path if you, if you go down this path, as long as you like creating something. Yeah, so I, I think that if you're the kind of person who always sees problems everywhere you go and you wake up and you see that traffic line hey what this is so stupid I don't like this you know and always thinking of all the different problems and you want to solve it right this is a course that really <laughs> is focused on problem solving right uh, and finding creative solutions and then sometimes you bring it all the way through right uh, it's a really fun course for that um, maybe my only other advice is make sure it's something that you do like right uh, something that's fun it's gonna be four years uh, so yeah and yeah, a lot of options, like Celine said, after you graduate, like, you can do really a lot of things. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Celine and Wenshu. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to add just a small little bit of things, uh, just to thank everybody who has been participating and also the audience, right? Um, now, uh, you know, um, Wenshu and Celine, we just told them a few days ago, can you just join in? In fact, Wenshu, just two days. Um, and uh, all they've asked us is, what do you want me to say? I say, just speak the truth. Right. The, the, I think that's the, the thing that we, um, hopefully you might catch something about the alumni network over here and how, you know, everyone is still very connected. Uh, and I, I mean, there's nothing to rehearse or to prepare. Uh, hopefully you catch that. Um, this course is exactly like that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, uh, sorry, I guess before, before everyone goes, um, I just have one last question coming in from a prospective student. Uh, what's the acceptance rate like? So meaning if we are only accepting about, about 50 students in the end, um, but how many, is there a rough number of, you know, how many students actually do get to attend the interview? I think Nadira would know what you said. Usually our acceptance rate is about um, around 80 to 90%. So, um, yeah, so we usually, um, you know, subs uh, successful applicants, when we offer them, uh, they will, likely they will accept the offer and then uh, matriculate with us. Oh, Nadira, I think maybe, I don't know if the question from the student might be like, how many do we turn away, <laughs> you know, the uh, total applicants and, yeah, because I think you're saying that after we offer them, uh, they, hmm. 80 to 90 will actually formally come in because they, yeah, they've received the offer, they'll come in still. So, uh, Desri, I think the question might be more on like, what's the total applicants? Yeah. And, and how many get to get in, right? Yep. Okay, usually we receive around like um, 200 to 250 applicants. Subsequently, we will actually um, uh, shortlist them based on their uh, certain criteria that we're uh, looking at. Then subsequently, we will interview around 150 to 180 uh, candidates. Then subsequently, uh, after they have yeah, completed their interview session, then we will shortlist uh, further to offer. So, so the intake is around 40 to 50 every year. This year, I think it's 50 plus, right? 50 plus, yeah. Around 50 to 55. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, we, let's not hold up the rest of the sessions that might be going on right, yeah. or your lunch. <laughs> yeah. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, if you see on your screen now, you have a, we have a few QR codes there. Uh, so yeah, if, if you could spend some time to just give us some feedback about how today's session went, uh, please scan the QR code on the left most. And of course, please uh, join us in our, on our Telegram chat, where Telegram group where you can chat with you know, some of our current students, alumni, as well as tutors there to get more of your questions answered. And of course, um, you can check out the, the main NUS website to find out more information and get more links uh, from there. But so yeah, if not, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. 
our alumni special guests, uh, current tutors and students, and of course, all the prospective students joining us here today. Thank you so much for uh, your time. And if you wish to join us later on as well, we have another session starting at 2.30.